Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. Recently I had the opportunity to moderate a special free webinar with the Department of Health and the Minnesota Climate Change Task Force about how climate change is impacting our health here in Minnesota. We talked about growing air pollution to extreme heat related days to increasing floods and drought that threaten our ecosystem here in Minnesota. In this program we join the webinar in progress and hear from Lynn Marcus with the Minnesota League of Women Voters, the Climate Change Task Force Force and Kristen Robb with the Minnesota Department of Health. We begin with Kristen Robb on our air pollution. Sometimes people do not understand how climate change and personal health are linked. After all, climate change has been associated with melting ice caps and polar bears in the Arctic and not with a visit to your very own physician here in Minnesota for an asthma attack. This is a great graphic that visually connects something so abstract as rising greenhouse gas emissions with climate change threats. Starting at the top, the rise in greenhouse gases is leading to increased temperatures and changes in precipitation. Minnesota's temperature has warmed three degrees Fahrenheit between 1895 and 2020, and annual precipitation has increased by 3.4 inches. But average increases do not tell us the full story. Rain is falling more frequently in heavy, extreme localized events. So that some part of our state is experiencing flooding while other parts of our state are experiencing drought. In fact, several counties in Minnesota have had both a disaster declaration for flooding by FEMA and a disaster declaration for drought by the USDA in the same year. So these changes in our atmosphere are disrupting our air quality, weather patterns, water cycles, and ecosystems, which in turn are leading to more air pollution, extreme heat, flooding and drought, and ecosystem threats. Many of these changes are happening right now, but all of these changes will impact the health of people and all of these impacts will most likely increase. All of them, these things that we call climate hazards, so air pollution, extreme heat, flooding and droughts and ecosystem threats are associated with a wide range of health impacts. Some of these climate hazards cause direct health effects, so like a heat related illness from a heat wave, and some cause indirect health effects like exacerbation of asthma from mold growth in a flooded basement. So we know this is a lot of information to digest, but we're gonna do our best to walk through many of these impacts over the next slides. So starting with air pollution. Increases in air pollution can result directly from greenhouse gas emissions, but also from the effect of rising temperatures on the formation and release of pollutants. In Minnesota, ozone, particulate matter, and allergens are the air contaminants that we're most concerned about with climate change. These pollutants can have direct health effects, such as causing or exacerbating cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, including chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, allergies, and asthma. Indirect health effects from air pollution can include reduced visibility on a high smog day, reduced productivity at work or school due to allergies or asthma, and reduced productivity and degradation of crops and water sources, which can lead to economic burdens. So who's most at risk? Well, children, because they have developing lungs, they're outside more and they play vigorously and inhale more air per pound of body weight compared to adults. Adults over 60, because their bodies are aging, people with chronic respiratory or cardiovascular diseases because they are more susceptible to air pollution, individuals living near other sources of air pollution, such as roadways or freeways or heavy industry, and that's because they're chronically exposed to air pollution. And then people of color, because they are more likely to be exposed to more air pollution and have a disproportionate burden of heart and lung diseases, which can increase susceptibility. So just in case you don't know what ground level ozone and particulate matter are, I'm going to just provide a really brief description. So ground level ozone is a gas that is not emitted directly from emission sources. It's formed through a chemical reaction in the environment. Ozone pollution levels tend to rise on very hot and sunny days with little wind. 
The sun and heat increase the speed at which this chemical reaction occurs, causing ozone pollution levels to increase. Due to the nature of this reaction, the highest ozone levels tend to occur downwind of the urban core. Particulate matter is small pieces of airborne particles, including dirt, dust, soot, smoke, and liquid droplets. Some particles are so small that they can be inhaled deep into the lungs and even enter the bloodstream. On this slide, you can see an average grain of table salt magnified relative to a particle that is 10 microns and one that is 2.5 microns. It is these very small particles that we're most worried about when it comes to health. Fine particulate pollution can be elevated at any time of the year, but in Minnesota, the highest levels are typically measured between November and March, although this could be changing. In general, we breathe clean air in Minnesota according to federal standards. But on some days and in some locations, our air is unhealthy due to ozone or fine particulate matter. And climate change is threatening to make these unhealthy air days more frequent and more intense. As a good example, you may remember the unprecedented air quality event we had in August. The event was triggered from smoke, including particulate matter 2.5, from massive fires burning in Canada. The map on this slide shows the maximum observed 24-hour air quality index or AQI category. The air quality index creates a standard number to show the health impacts of air pollutants. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency issues air quality alerts for AQI values 101 and higher. So 101 to 150 AQI translates to the orange category in the chart meaning the air is unhealthy for sensitive groups. Larger AQI numbers are associated with greater health risks. Well, this was the second time a statewide air quality alert had been issued in Minnesota. And the first one was in 2018. It was the first time a multi-day air quality alert was issued statewide. It was also the longest duration of an air quality alert, eight days. And it was the first time in Minnesota where the daily AQI reached the purple level or over 200, meaning that the air quality was unhealthy for everyone, not just those that might be more sensitive to poor air quality. Some places saw an hourly concentration of over 400, the highest AQI level, including St. Cloud at 422 and Brainerd at 401. The number one thing you can do to protect yourself and your family from poor air quality is to stay informed. So you can sign up for the air quality notification or air now to get current conditions for Minnesota's air quality, or you can download the Minnesota air mobile app. The second thing you can do is avoid exposure to poor air quality by limiting your time outdoors or taking it easy if you must be outside. Other things you can do include keeping your air, indoor air as clean as possible by using an air cleaner, avoid increasing indoor air pollution by not smoking or frying foods. People with asthma or other breathing conditions should make sure that they have a rescue inhaler with them and you should have a plan, talk to your doctor and have a plan for handling those poor air quality events. An N95 mask, if worn properly and properly fitted, can offer you some protection outdoors. Always talk to a doctor if you're having trouble breathing or if your conditions worsen. Another impact on the air we breathe is the intensive that's intensifying with climate change is pollen. There are three pollen seasons in Minnesota, trees, grasses, and weeds. Trees are the first to release pollen, typically starting in April. Grasses usually ramp up pollen release in early June, and weeds typically begin re releasing pollen in mid-June and continue into the first hard frost. Not only do we have three pollen seasons to deal with, yay for allergy sufferers like myself, but research has shown that the growing, that the growing season for ragweed pollen, which is highly al allergenic, has increased by 15 to 25 days in and around Minnesota. The lengthening pollen season is strongly related to climate change characteristics such as the lengthening 
of our frost free season and then the later timing of the first fall frost. Who is the allergy culprit? Can you tell? One is ragweed, the other is goldenrod, and one of these plants is innocent of causing allergies. Why, you might ask? Well, pollen allergies are caused by wind-blown clouds of pollen from tiny flowers. The plant that shows more showy blooms attracts the pollinators to it so they can gather the pollen instead of relying upon wind distribution of pollen. Because goldenrod blooms about the same time as ragweed, it is often wrongly identified as a problem and unfairly removed. Goldenrod is needed for pollinators and for biodiversity in a sustainable ecosystem. The ragweed is on the right and it has leaves that are more finely cut than the goldenrod on the left. So when we think of extreme weather in Minnesota, we tend to think of floods or tornadoes, but we have extreme heat events here as well. Higher heat, increased humidity, and longer and more frequent extreme heat events can lead to dehydration and heat stroke. Untreated heat stroke can lead to death. He can also worsen existing health conditions, such as a various respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. People most at risk are people who are more exposed, including outdoor workers, so people that work in agriculture and construction, student athletes, people who live in the cities due to the heat island effect, and people without air conditioning and unhoused persons. And people can be at a higher risk also because they are more susceptible for physiological reasons. So this includes people with underlying medical conditions, pregnant women, older adults, infants, and young children. Just as one example of the devastating effects of heat, in the summer of 2011, we had six days when the heat index was 105 degrees or higher. And that same summer, we had 1,302 emergency department visits and three deaths due to heat. What makes these numbers tragic is that heat-related illnesses and deaths are completely preventable. From 2000 to 2019, there were 63 deaths in Minnesota due to heat. This chart shows emergency department visits by age groups. Although the number and rate of visits change every year, so year to year, trends show that the group that most frequently ends up in the emergency department due to heat is 15 to 34 year olds. And then next is adults 65 and older. These two groups consistently have higher rates of heat related emergency department visits than any other age group. So there are many things you can do to prevent heat related illness. The key is to, to stay cool, hydrated and informed. So drink water, fluids frequently throughout the day, take a cold shower to cool off, limit outdoor activities and if outside take frequent breaks in the shade and drink plenty of water. Wear light colored and lightweight clothing as well as a hat to protect you from the sun. Definitely avoid alcohol and caffeine when you're hot. You can also help others stay safe in extreme heat. So check on children, people ages 15 to 34 years old, we just talked about them, and the elderly for signs or symptoms of heat-related illness. The health department has a really nice graphic of telling the difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke, and you can find that link on the slide. Also check in with family or neighbors who might be more at risk. So especially those who live alone or have chronic health conditions like diabetes or high blood pressure or kidney disorders, which can make, which those diseases can be made worse by heat exposure. Also MDH developed an extreme heat toolkit that can help organizations and local governments plan for extreme heat events. And that too can be found on the link on the slide. So increased frequency and severity of heavy rainfalls can lead to flooding, which has a number of health impacts like injury or death from drowning, illnesses from being exposed to contaminated drinking water or recreational sources, 
mental health stress from experiencing the trauma of the event or later from being displaced or dealing with a damaged home or business. Respiratory ailments from exposure to mold from flooded basements or carbon monoxide poisoning from exposure to carbon monoxide when using secondary power sources like generators. Flooding can also disrupt economic and social networks and put a strain on essential services. People most at risk are people who are more likely to be exposed to floodwaters, like those who are living in a floodplain or near a water body, or people who cannot easily evacuate or recover from flooding destruction, such as people who do not have reliable transportation, people who can't use the stairs when an elevator is out of service, people in wheelchairs, people with disabilities, older adults, and lower income people. What does flooding look like? You may have experienced this already. Heavy rains can cause standing water where we don't want it, like in our backyards or basements. Many homeowners have experienced wet basements, which is mentally and financially stressful. And if mold starts to grow, that becomes even more of a health concern. Localized flash flooding can, lead, can also be a problem where our infrastructure is undersized and people get caught off guard by roads that have become like rivers. This is an important public health safety concern as almost half of flash flood fatalities occur in vehicles. Many just don't realize how little water it takes to pose a safety risk. It takes as little as six inches of fast moving water to knock over and carry away an adult. And as little as 12 inches can carry away a small car. Always avoid driving through submerged parts of roads. They say, turn around, don't drown. Another public health concern we have with the precipitation changes caused by climate change is waterborne disease outbreaks. This diagram illustrates how heavy downpours can lead to a host of problems, including increased runoff and sewage overflows, which can then cause outbreaks of waterborne diseases such as E. coli and cryptosporidium. Runoff can also carry those viruses and other disease causing agents into wells and recreational water, contaminating them and then causing health so there are a number of things you can do before, during, and after a flood to keep your family safe. And a few resources are listed on the slide. Most importantly, you wanna talk with your family about what you need to do and make a plan to be prepared if a flood watcher warning is issued. Also make sure you stay informed about local conditions. And one way to do that is to sign up for alerts. Having a battery powered or hand cranked radio to listen to NOAA radio broadcasts can also be useful, especially if you don't have power or you aren't able to use your phone. Find out if you're located in a floodplain and if so, you should look into flooding insurance. And don't forget about your pets. If it's not safe for you to stay in your home during an emergency, it's probably not safe for them either. Make sure you have a plan for their safety too. Regarding plans, I'm happy to say that our local South Washington Watershed District identified climate change as a top priority and produced a 2018 Climate Resilience Plan. I know they're planning to update it um, in the next year or so. I think this next year. It engaged citizens, local governments, and stakeholders in the watershed management planning process. In a series of workshops, participates Participants listed climate hazards, who and what is at risk in their community, and prioritized needs um, regarding actions on groundwater, natural resources, stormwater infrastructure, and implementation strategies. The Watershed District summarized this information for each community to use in its own comprehensive plan to reduce risk through building climate resiliency. You may view this plan online to think about your community and what you might want. The link is on the bottom of this slide and it's listed in our resources slide at the end of this program. Excellent. 
So increases in temperature and changes in rain patterns are disrupting and changing our ecosystems, which can affect the spread of diseases caused by insects, ticks, and rodents, and can increase harmful algal blooms. So diseases from ticks in Minnesota include Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and babyosis. Diseases from mosquitoes include West Nile virus and lacrosse encephalitis. Harmful algal blooms can cause various liver, respiratory, and nervous system or skin disorders. Indirect health effects from ecosystem threats include financial strains or threats to livelihoods that are based on recreational dependent economies like camping, fishing, and hunting. People most at risk for diseases carried by insects, ticks, and rodents are people who are more exposed, meaning they spend more time outdoors where all these critters live. This map shows the expanding geography and increasing incidence of Lyme disease cases in Minnesota. As you can see, from 1996 to 2013, there is a definite shift westward in the state. In 2018, we had almost 1,000 confirmed Lyme disease cases and over 500 probable cases. And that is a physician diagnosed case that did not meet clinical evidence criteria for a confirmed case, but had labor laboratory evidence of infection. So examining tick-borne disease risks specifically with increases in temperatures, ticks will become active sooner, they'll stay active longer, allowing more time to develop and feed on hosts. There may also be a decreased die-off over the winter months if temperatures do not get very cold. An increase in temperature can also lead to new tick species moving into and surviving in Minnesota, which could lead to the introduction of new diseases. Ticks really like humidity, so with increased precipitation, this may also aid tick survivability in the summer and extend their feeding times each day. So those teeny bites can have a really big impact and ticks are a concern for anyone who likes to be outside. MDH has some great resources, including short videos to learn more. And then there are things you can do to prevent tick bites, such as um, wearing insect repellent, doing a tick check after being outdoors, taking a shower, which helps wash off the ticks before they become attached to your skin. And you can also become aware of Lyme disease symptoms so that if you do get bitten, you can see a doctor right away and get treatment. So an increase in water temperature can also lead to blue-green algal blooms, which contain toxins that can pose harmful health risks. People or pets who drink or swim in water with dangerous levels of harmful algal bloom contamination may experience stomach illness, skin irritation, allergic responses, and damage to the liver and nervous system. In extreme cases, dogs and other animals have died from drinking water contaminated with these toxins. Harmful algal blooms in Minnesota lakes result from a number of factors, including runoff from fertilizers, discharges from waste water treatment plants, warmer waters, and higher temperatures. While harmful algal blooms can occur naturally, the frequency of outbreaks is increasing in part because of human activities that create favorable conditions for the blooms. When in doubt, stay out. So climate change also poses a number of threats to our mental health. Climate change can cause mental health impacts through the direct exposure to a climate related disaster like flooding, through the disruption of a major determinant of health, such as a loss of livelihood or a cultural tradition, or through awareness or uncertainty of climate change as an existential threat. These experiences may overlap and lead to compounded impacts on an individual or even an entire community, such as family farmers burdened with decadal drought who are more likely to commit suicide. Existing research has associated several mental health conditions with climate change, such as psychological distress, 
grief reactions, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, interpersonal conflicts, drug or alcohol abuse, loss of identity, and suicide ideation. People most at risk include the youth. Youth are at increased risk for distress and anxiety in the aftermath of an extreme event. Women, they have a higher prevalence of post-traumatic disorder and other mental health disorders after disaster than men. Elderly tend to have higher rates of untreated depression and physical ailments that contribute to their overall vulnerability. Communities of color and immigrants because of limited English because of social isolation related to language barriers that may inhibit their ability to prepare for or respond to and cope with climate changes and related disasters. Unhoused populations, a combination of risk factors make people who are experiencing homelessness more at risk to the negative impacts of climate change. Also occupational exposure, Healthcare and public safety workers are at an increased risk for short-term and long-term mental health consequences. And lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and other identities may be at increased risk due to social stigmatization, harassment, and abuse. So talking about your feelings with others can help, or if needed, definitely seek professional assistance. MDH has created a discussion guide for parents and caregivers about how to talk with youth about climate change. And the link to this resource is on the slide. Also the American Psychological Associ Association published a summary of the impacts and responses to mental health in our changing climate. The link to these resources are also on the slide. Another great way to deal with the stress of climate change is to get involved in climate action. This can help build your own sense of resiliency and efficacy, and it can foster optimism, and it can connect you to others, which helps you dissipate feelings of that loneliness and hopelessness. The implications of our changing climate may seem pretty stark after a closer look at the realities we're facing but we're not going to improve things with the doom and gloom outlook. We can flip the threat of climate change into an opportunity and all play a part in positive change. The Lancet, a well-respected medical journal, originally asserted that climate change was the biggest health threat, and it still is. But a few years later, the Lancet published a glass half full statement saying, tackling climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. Now more than ever, we have an opportunity, a necessity really to build resilience at all levels in the face of climate change. If you want to watch the entire hour long webinar on how climate change impacts our health here in Minnesota, as well as what our state is doing to address climate change and on what you and your family can do to protect your health, visit the League of Women Voters of Woodbury Cottage Grove area website. Well, that's our program for you. Join us again next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone.